Now I want you to picture Jesus. You know how Jesus is so thoughtful, right? He's so loving. He's so caring. He always has our interests at heart. And I'm not going to let things to get the best of me. So, you, you know, we have this right idea about Jesus. And here, he was sleeping. Cast all your cares upon the Lord. Cast all your cares upon the Lord. For he cares for you. And he knows what you're going through. Why don't you cast all your cares upon the Lord? We bless the name of Jesus. Come on and let's sing, Lord, you are awesome. Oh, Lord, Lord, you are awesome. 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 Yes, you are. Lord, you are awesome. Lord, you are awesome. Oh, and if it wasn't for your love, and if it wasn't for your grace, I don't know where I'd be without you. Oh Lord, if it wasn't for your love, and if it wasn't for your grace, I don't know where I'd be without you. Oh Lord, Lord, you are awesome. Yes, you are. Lord, you are awesome. Lord, you are awesome. Take God at his word. Things go so much better. Did you know that? Just taking God at his word. Because he's so credible. He has such an integrity that uh, when he, it, and it blesses the Lord when we express the faith. I believe what you said, Lord. It just, it, you know, it just gives him that desire to, uh, to, move, to move on and do wonderful things. So, Let's let this year be that kind of year. So if you have found Matthew chapter 8, if you will stand, let's stand together. <clears throat> and we're going to read, beginning at verse 23, we're going to read a, read a segment down through verse 27. Beginning at verse 23, and when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Together, but the, but the men marveled, saying, What, what manner of man, man, man is this? this? That, that even the, the winds and the sea obey him. him. Praise God. Praise God. Let us pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, it is a privilege and an honor to just come before you in prayer and to thank you, to acknowledge your presence, acknowledge your, your goodness and mercy that's extended to us constantly. And even this, in this hour, we thank you. And we do give praise to you, Lord, for your mercies, your kindness shown to us. Many didn't make it to 2018, but Lord, we're here. And we truly, truly thank you for it. 
We know that it was not something we'd done better than some of the others that didn't make it, but it was mercy. And so we are so grateful to you today. Thank you, Father. Bless these that are hearing by way of television. Bless, Lord, these that are here in this body in Jesus' name. Father, we'll give all praise and honor and glory to you. Have the free reign, have free course to minister to us that which we need today in Jesus' name. Thank you. Amen. God bless you and you may be seated. Praise the Lord. Praise God. I trust that you all had a good week this past week. And um, these holidays are good. And here we are in 2018. 2017 went so fast. But here we are in 2018. And the time goes faster. The older you get, it seems time goes faster. Well, we're here looking at Matthew chapter 8. Can I say something before we go? Can we loosen up a little bit? <laughs> you know, it used to make me tense when people are tense, but I'm not going to be tense. <laughs> but can we just loosen up a little bit? You know, everything. Believe it or not, everything is okay. And everything is going to be okay. If you just look at somebody and say, you have been forgiven. You have been released. And the righteous judge says you're not guilty. So let's thank him for it. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, on last week we said, wow, we look not at the things that are seen, right? Because the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. So our views, remember we're not looking at the circumstances of this week's happening, right? We're not looking at our monies, right? We're not looking at the challenges that we are facing, but let's keep our focus now. We're looking at Things that are not seen. For the things that are not seen are eternal. Those are eternal realities. Today we're going to talk a little about when God speaks to the winds. When God speaks to the winds. It's one thing for human to speak to winds. We don't have that kind of power, right? But we just read here in the Bible that our Lord and Savior can speak to nature. He can speak to winds, and as he can speak to the ocean, to the sea. And we want to look a little closer at what took place when God spoke to the winds. Follow with me again, starting at verse 23. The Bible says, and when he was entered into a ship his disciples followed him so here we see first of all Jesus entering a ship and we see his disciples following him there was no boisterous winds at the time the sea was pretty much calm because it didn't mention until he had gotten they had gotten on the way that the winds came arose, right? So we must know and assume that when he led them into the water, into the boat, the ship, everything was calm. So, but what I what I what I looked when I looked at that a little closer, I it uh, focused my attention on following Jesus. Jesus led them into a boat to go to the other side of the sea. And seeing that they followed him, they incurred whatever he incurred, right? And following Jesus is a good thing, but following Jesus also can lead us into things that we normally wouldn't go through. Right? 
All right, now, again, I'll read this. It says, And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. So they got in the boat, and everything was okay. But he fell asleep. Now, as I thought about that, the thought came to me counting the cost of following Jesus. When you follow Jesus, when we follow Jesus, there is a cost involved, right? Was it not Jesus that says, uh, talking about building a tower or some kind of construction or edifice, and first and foremost doing what? Counting the cost, right? So there is a cost involved in even in following Jesus. So he was implying when you purpose in your heart to follow Jesus, know or before you consider following him, consider first counting the cost. Knowing that there is a cost involved in following Jesus. Right? Uh, so that's very scriptural, count the cost. Uh, if a man's going to build a construction and he just want to build without counting the cost, then somewhere along he may not have enough money to build, right? And so he has to leave it off and uh, under all kinds of conditions, and it may, you know, things could just happen. He never finished the thing. So counting the cost is important. And since we are following Jesus, if we count the cost, we're going to finish the race, right? We know that there are going to be some things that's going to happen as we follow Jesus because Jesus don't always go into the places that we like to go. Isn't that right? <laughs> All right. So for us, it could be just a bed of ease. We like ease, right? I mean, the average person does, right? They just don't like things to happen out of the ordinary. So if I was going to uh, follow, have people to follow me, not follow Jesus, then I would avoid every obstacle every mountain, every stronghold, every, everything, right? Because I, I wouldn't want any turbulence. But following Jesus is not that way. He leads us. Now remember when the Holy Spirit led Jesus to the wilderness, right? Matthew 4. So Jesus was following the lead of the Holy Spirit his, and the Father. So as he was, the Spirit of God led him into a wilderness kind of experience. God led the children of Israel into the wilderness, right? So following God, there's a cost involved. If a person says, well, I, nah, I, following Jesus is too tragic. I don't, I don't want to do, do that because, you know, I'm, I'm not able to endure the things that he may lead me through. But if, on the other hand, a person says, well, that's the best thing that can happen to a person following Jesus. We are not our own. We can't take care of ourselves. But if we follow Jesus, he'll provide for us. He'll protect us in the midst of everything. Right? So following Jesus, when I count that cost, it's still better to follow him no matter how, where he leads me. Right? So counting the cost is one thing. And then the other thing was, here's what he said. If any man will come after me, let him first do what? Denying himself. See, that's a part of the cost, right? The part of the cost in following Jesus is denying the self. Self-life loves what it loves, right? But he said, let him first deny himself. Then he says, and do what? Take up his cross. And that means suffering, right? And the third thing he says, and follow me. So following God, where he leads me, I will follow. So that was the first thing that I saw the disciples were following Jesus. So they got in the boat. Everything was okay. And they start sailing to the other side for the other side. But what they didn't uh, anticipate with Jesus, things were not going to be bad at all. So it was common for that uh, Sea of Galilee to, uh, to have sudden storms and things like that. That was common according to the studies. And Jesus knew it when he said, let's go to the other side, right? And perhaps the disciples may have known that it could happen, but the fact that they were with Jesus was like, okay, I ain't worried about it. So when he led them into the boat and all of a sudden at a certain point there arose a tempest. You know, 
he was sleeping at the wrong time. Right? Anybody ever felt like Jesus is sleeping at the wrong time when all the things that's going on in your life and you want to shake him and say, Lord, you, 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 you must not be looking at what's going on in my life. <laughs> but he is. He, he sees it. So that was the first thing, following Jesus. And then the second thing, as I looked at, look at this, verse 24. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves. But he was asleep. Now picture this now, a great tempest, and a tempest is basically like a windstorm, a violent windstorm. That's what a tempest is, okay? And this violent storm, and on another account, when they had gone through the Sea of Galilee, the Bible says the winds were boisterous, they were loud, and, you know. So here, they attempted to go across the sea here, and the tempest, this storm, violent windstorm, uh, came about, arose. Now, the sea in other passages of the scripture can represent people, a multitude of people. And also, winds are indicative of spirits. It, sometimes it showed the Holy Spirit as the wind, as a mighty rushing mighty wind, and it shows spirits uh, as winds, all right? So if we look at the passage that the sea represented people or, and the winds could represent spirits, we can sort of bring it a little bit home to how we can relate to uh, 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 tempests, right? Now... Um, so he said again, verse 24, and behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. So as I looked at that, the effects, the second point I want to mention is not only following Jesus, that was the first thought I saw out of this topic of when God speaks to the wind. The second thing was the effect of of the tempest. The winds had a certain effect upon the sea, right? Upon the boat or the ship, right? And upon his disciples, right? Now, if winds can be indicative of spirits, spirits can come on your Christian journey when you're following Jesus. They can come because they don't want you to follow Jesus. And they can come to interfere with your journey. When we look at the sea, if it does represent people here, the wind was causing some disturbance in the sea, right? When spirits come to bring disturbance upon people, people get fearful. Are you hearing what I'm saying? People get fearful. They may be following Jesus, but sometimes they can get fearful. They look at the effects of the wind, the effects of the spirits, and they get afraid. Look at somebody that says, Jesus is still in the storm. And he's still saying, be not afraid. <laughs> so the winds had an effect first upon the sea and because it had an effect upon the sea it had an effect upon the ship or the boat right now and when it has an effect upon the boat get this it affected the boat's movement are you with me and when those spirits come and affect people they can affect our movement you're moving in the vein of God, but because spirits are moving upon people and making them afraid or making them complacent. Anybody understand what I'm trying to say? Then it causes, it, it causes a, a, a certain uh, re reaction there. And so here, this wind was moving upon a calm sea. It just arose. And it moved upon the calm sea, and because of the waves in the sea, right, 
they affected the ship or the boat, right? And that boat was their cargo, right? The boat was that which was transporting them. And as God, by his spirit, sometimes moves us and leads us, sometimes those winds come to interfere with the movement, with the cargo, with the going of the spirit of God moving our lives. And it causes us sometimes to be afraid. Sometimes people get complacent. They lose sight of what God has told them. Uh, anybody hear what I'm saying? When they lose sight of what God says, see, because without a vision, um, people cast off restraint. They no longer get committed to what God is saying. You know what I'm saying? So the vision or revelation is to cause us to be committed to what God is saying. And so when the winds come, you see, they affect the movement. And when they affect that movement they cause a person to begin to become complacent and begin to figure out what else can I do this ain't working come on somebody give God a praise the effects of the tempest tempest come to affect the sea affect the people affect the cargo of the ship and so here we see Jesus lying there asleep. The, the question would be, how can Jesus be asleep at a time like this? Why is it not affecting him to the point where he could be merciful and at least acknowledge that there's a storm going on? But in still, it seemed like he just didn't know what was going on. Anybody ever felt like that? You see, when you pass through things and Jesus seen, appear that he's asleep, you know, certain things can happen. See, now winds are working and their target is to get you off target, get your focus off so that you will not be moving in faith, but you can be moving contrary to faith, right? And then you guess what happens when you start moving contrary to faith? You start speaking just what you're feeling. Y'all didn't hear what I'm saying. You start to speaking what you're feeling. And you see, he must not affect our speech because when he affects our speech, death and life is in the power of the tongue. Hallelujah. As long as I can keep my speech right, God's going to bring me through. It doesn't look like nothing, but he's going to bring me through because he's a covenant keeping God. Hallelujah. And so I can keep on going through. And when it looks contrary, I can keep on as long as my vision is not focused, uh, uh, is not tainted with. As long as I'm still seeing like I'm supposed to see, the winds can't move me. Hallelujah. And so the Lord said the effects of the storm, the effects of the tempest, it caused the sea and the waves to just begin to move and, and move. And, and that, which was, that which was steady, if you will, that which was settled, if you will, that which was going along right smoothly, all of a sudden began to rock a little bit and rock and real because of the movement of the winds hallelujah it began to cause it the boat to just rock a little bit and rock a, and toss and turn and then they couldn't see too good because the waves now had gotten so high it began to obstruct their vision and so the disciples hollered out hello somebody God get up from there we're about to be destroyed Now, I want you to picture Jesus. You know how Jesus is so thoughtful, right? He's so loving. He's so caring. He always has our interests at heart. And I'm not going to let things to get the best of me. So, you, you know, we have this right idea about Jesus. And here, he was sleeping. Where is your discernment, Jesus? Why are you not discerning what we're going through? You know we're afraid. I, I, Lord, I, I'm not understanding you here. So finally, it got the best of them. They went over to where he was. Master, get up. <laughs> get up there. Don't you understand? 
Don't you see? We're about to be destroyed here. Can I tell you something? Those situations are not going to destroy you. Not going to happen. Because of this great God. Listen, he knows just how much you can take. And the word of God says he will not suffer the righteous to be moved. In other words, what he's saying is that uh, you can get to a point where, in, <coughs> you know, if you tell somebody, if you tell somebody, okay, that's it. I'm out of here. I can't take no more. But you don't mean it. You're trying to get God's attention, right? Now, y'all probably don't do that, but sometimes that can happen. So, okay, I'm out of here. I've had enough. That's just, that's just, I'm not taking this anymore. But it's just something to get God's attention. And so God knows when a person saying it but not meaning it, right? In other words, they're not at the end, but they're just saying it, trying to get God to, 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 to get, get some attention. But now here's the thing. When a person is at their end, they ain't going to say nothing. They're going to make a move if something don't happen. That's when God steps in. You hear what I'm saying? That's when God steps in. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's like a man, if he's going to rob the bank, he's not going to run to him. But watch out now, I'm going to rob this man. <laughs> he's not going to do that right. <laughs> oh, he would be crazy to do that, but he's not going to say <laughs> So God knows when we are at our end. And brother and sisters, let me tell you, every time he's going to rise up and do something. Every time he'll rise up and do something. All of, all of my times following God, uh, there were times when I said, okay, I can't take no more. No, no, no. But I kept right on. I was still in the trial. Why? Because it was like God's, uh, uh, you know, it ain't up to you. And then when I got to my wits end, I began to look somewhere else. I began to try to figure out what I'm going to do now. And I began to take some steps toward that. Then here come God. He began to make himself known now because he knew I had all I could take. Ha, ah, glory to God. Woo, glory to God. Hallelujah. And brothers and sisters, when you had all you can take, you ain't going around telling people nothing. You're making decisions the best you can to get out of it. And the Lord says, I see it. Now it's time for me to get in there and do something now. I saw your 